Oh, I am going to go now to our last garden of the day. Whoops, I'm not. I have to have one more thing before. Okay, so this um, is a word from the Watershed Nursery. The Watershed Nursery is located in Point Richmond. Owners Laura Hansen and Diana Benner and their team grow hundreds of species of California native plants. The Watershed Nursery is open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 to four. You can shop in person in their large outdoor nursery or you can place an order for curbside pickup. You can reach them at thewatershednursery.com. And I just had to include this adorable photo of the Watershed Nursery. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to bring the Watershed Nursery to you, your attention right now as they supplied many of the plants that were included in the next garden that you'll be seeing. And this is our last garden for the day. And then after this garden visit is over, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, next week. So stick with us if you can till the very tail end. Uh, this is Susan Billings and Dennis Fortin's garden in El Cerrito. This is a new garden. We'll be talking about garden design. Uh, the theme is from weeds to wildlife, getting started with a native plant garden. It'll uh, be presented to us by Susan Billings and Sally Bryan from 4B Garden Design. And uh, the, Susan, who has been attending the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour since its inception in 2005, had long yearned for a native plant garden that would attract wildlife. However, when she and her husband Dennis moved into Susan's childhood home, they were challenged by the garden, which had been engulfed by a sea of weeds. After some experimentation, they realized they didn't have enough knowledge about how to design and install a hardscape or how to choose the appropriate native plants. Happily, they found Sally Bryan of 4B Garden Design, who designed and installed a garden that would attract birds, bees, bugs, and butterflies. This is an overview of their new garden, which was just installed in the winter of 2020. Uh, Sally repurposed their 100-year-old tumble-down rock walls that had previously terraced the slope, and these stones are now enjoying a new life as the backbone of a 25 foot long stream that emerges from a seep and tumbles down the hillside, cascading into several pools before spilling into a pond. So we're going to, before we go to Susan and Sally, we're gonna look at a brief uh, video of the stream. All right, so let's go now to Susan and Sally. Hello, Sally, how are you? I am well, thank you so much for having me here again. It's a pleasure to be part of this amazing uh, presentation. So I'm right. getting there we are. So is, okay, you're is ready. it visible for us, everybody? I can see it. Okay. Go ahead, Susan. Oh, sorry, hi. Um, as Kathy said, in 2011, my husband and I moved into my childhood home, which my father had built, and um, discovered that the backyard, which had previously been a very productive vegetable garden, had been, as he aged, allowed to run to weeds and gophers. Um, and I did a few, few attempts to start gardening. Um, I planted uh, some natives, which I didn't have a sufficient watering system, so a lot of them died. Um, and after a number of years, and especially after watching last year's uh, talk by Doug Talmy, um, decided that it was time to get somebody in to help with this project, which was just way beyond my time or my skills. Um, my goals were to have a habitat garden that would provide water, and nesting sites and food for birds and insects. Um, I wanted to make use of those rocks that were all over the site um, to make some kind of a water feature. So I found Sally through the garden tour last year and we met up and connected. And so we want to take it from here. So um, designing and installing habitat gardens is what I do. And it brings me a lot of pleasure to help our planet Earth and our critters who live on it um, 
by uh, creating a space for them to thrive and uh, live happily and comfortably. So when I walked into Susan and Dennis's garden, I see great potential. I don't notice the weeds. I don't feel overwhelmed. I um, really enjoy that first meeting with um, my clients. So these are a few photos of that first visit. And what I am doing is looking at the space. Uh, I'm looking at the soil type. So I'm thinking about which plants will go well in that soil. I'm looking at the sun, where it travels across the garden, which areas are going to have shade, um, the hottest part of the garden. And I'm looking at um, the perimeter for larger plants, thinking about shelters for um, the space and then for humans. So this is a garden that's going to be enjoyed by Dennis and Susan and her family and friends. And so I'm thinking about the paths um, for them to meander through their garden and really enjoy it, as well as um, where they want to sit and, and be observers of um, all of the wildlife that's going to come there. So this photo that you see on the left, those little um, flags are um, me beginning to think about uh, the past that will wander through. So um, Susan and Dennis had wanted to put a water feature in, which is very important for habitat gardens. What you want to do is create a place for them to live 12 months of the year. So they need water. All animals need water in different forms, and uh, as well as food 12 months of the year, and then shelter. So they had thought about placing the babbling brook on the side of their yard, and it was a perfect space with a with a nice hillside for it to meander down. And then, of course, it's near their home, and they're building a deck right now, so they can see it from that deck and hear it, as you got to see in that um, video before. It has a beautiful sound to it. So after visiting their garden and um, doing a soil test, I created a design. I like to hand draw my designs and not use the computer. I was an art teacher for many years and I just find it more enjoyable to um, do it the old fashioned way. And maybe I'm a little older as well. So as I was designing um, their garden, I was thinking about the size of the plant. So if you notice the perimeter has much larger um, shrubs and things are very densely planted, not in the images you'll see because it's a new garden, but uh, it will eventually grow into a very dense um, area all around the sides for shelter for birds and other um, dragonflies and butterflies to uh, cocoon and, and sleep at night. And um, one of the things is that birds actually nest oftentimes in this lower shrubbery, not necessarily way up in the tree, Crows and hawks nest way up high, but many of the songbirds nest at a lower location. So this was a sizing. Um, I already am thinking about which specific plants, but this um, was just to do a, a design and then the hardscape uh, location. Um, what we decided is, was to change where they were to hang out and view the garden and uh, view the um, babbling brook and so we added a patio right in the middle and it's nestled right right below some citrus trees so it creates a really nice sort of shelter for the people too. And then I did a drawing. Um, I work with uh, um, a hardscape uh, construction um, company, Lopez Landscaping, and so we collaborate together. And so I did a drawing for Miguel so he would have a good sense of what I meant by a babbling brook where the water would flow back and forth and the use of those uh, larger rocks that Susan wanted to repurpose. So here's an image of the construction of the hardscape and um, it doesn't look very good at this point. And so we just have to stay with the vision that, that, that at the end, it's going to look great. But this is where we were in about October. And then um, this, this is when I was planting. So Susan's garden was planted at uh, the very first rain of the season. And that is when you wanna plant. 
um, your garden is when it starts to cool down and it's going to get that rain. And this garden benefited the most from the winter rains. The roots were established and now it is thriving because of, of our carefully planned timing of planting. So here we have a panoramic uh, image. This was taken in April and uh, plants are pretty well established at this, at this point. So uh, looking at the various plants that I, that I put in, all of my plants are, are extremely intentional plants. So I'm thinking about making sure that um, there are flowers throughout the summer for the pollinators. I make sure that there are plants that will um, go to seed and have berries and those will be available for the birds in the winter. I'm thinking about um, uh, leaves. So a lot of birds eat petals and, and new leaves in the springtime. And then uh, the decomposing animals, uh, they will eat the leaves from the deciduous trees where the leaves drop down. They'll be eating those uh, dead leaves. So these are a few of the plants that we placed in there. And my favorite plants are the ones that are good for the birds and the bees and the butterflies and the hummingbirds. And so there are quite a few plants that um, hit up those four um, different kinds of species. This area here is a very hot and sunny area. So I've placed the manzanita up along the rocks uh, behind that and it will we will stop watering that after a few years. So the manzanita won't need the water. And then the fuchsia is another plant that uh, enjoys the hot sun. Notice the uh, we left those rocks there in that small um, wall and that is a very good habitat for lizards and um, salamanders will live in there. They like dark and cool places. This is the hottest area in the garden. It gets the afternoon sun, which is much more intense than morning sun. So this hillside has a variety of buckwheats, which are late blooming plants. Very important to have the late bloomers for the pollinators. And um, it also has a trichostema, which is in the top right corner. That is a plant that blooms almost 12 months of the year. So I have a few plants in there that are extremely long bloomers. Um, one, it looks really pretty, but two, it's um, very valuable for the pollinating uh, um, animals and the hummingbirds. So this is an afternoon shaded area and uh, we have some pipe stem uh, Dutchman pipe vine in the back area. It's going to be reaching towards the sun, but it likes to keep its roots in the shade and some coffee berry, which will grow nice and big eventually. Um, and some uh, annuals, the Clarkia, which should come back year after year. And then this is what the babbling brook looks like now. So you saw that hardscape picture and this was a uh, picture taken in April. So this gets the morning sun and then later on it, it gets shady. So these are some low growing plants because I want the uh, brook to be visible for, our, um, for everybody who comes to see it and also make sure that the pools are, um, are, are visible so that when the birds bathe there they can see predators. So they don't, they need to feel safe when they're bathing. And back to Susan with a few of her favorite plants. So I love coyote mint um, because of the smell and the color. Um, the butterflies and the hummingbirds and the native bees all love it. It smells great. It's, um, it's a host plant likely for six species. Calscapes lists um, host plants and it says, often it says, how many likely species it's host for. They haven't necessarily observed all those, but it definitely provides um, food for caterpillars. And I think we can go to the next. So the blue elderberry, I have a story about this one. Um, about a month after everything was planted, turkeys came into the yard and they chomped this down so it was the most pathetic little stem you ever saw. 
covered it up with some bird netting and it is now two feet tall. Blue elderberry is a really important keystone plant. It's, it's um, host possibly as many as 23 different moths and butterflies. And it is also one of the most important food sources for, for birds in California because it provides them with the fruit. It's also edible for humans, so I'm gonna leave mine for the birds. And it does have really pretty flowers and it's a nice dense foliage so the birds can nest there if they choose. Santa Cruz buckwheat is very attractive. You can see this is the one on the left is the one in my garden as it looks right now. It was a little tiny plant when Sally put it in and it's just done beautifully. Um, it hosts many butterflies and moths, moths, possibly as many as 23, including the Ackman blue butterfly. Uh, birds like to eat the seeds, bees like the pollen, and because it's a late bloomer, it's a really great um, plant to have in the garden. And our last one is the coffee berry. This is one of the plants that I had planted bef oh, like five years ago, and it hardly grew at all. And then this year, all those bright green leaves on the small plant on the left are what grew because it's finally getting water regularly. Um, the birds like to eat both the fruit and the seeds. It hosts a variety of, of butterflies and moths, and it's a good nesting site for birds. So those are just a few of the plants that we really, I'm really happy to have growing in the garden. Um, I did want to say something about the fact that we didn't plant any large trees. You may have noticed in some of the pictures, there's a giant sequoia on the other side of the fence. Um, that yard also has an oak tree. And my yard on the other side of the house has two oak trees, a redbud and coast redwoods. So there are a lot of large trees around, especially the important oak trees to provide uh, more food. So a few um, extra little tidbits is that Susan's garden, it was um, inhabited by many gophers and she let me know about that. And so every plant that I installed is placed inside a gopher basket. And so that is something that I highly recommend uh, paying the money for a good gopher basket. They, they work, uh, they're not harmful for the gophers and your plants won't get eaten. And so the planting of the garden took quite a bit longer, but the benefit is that she didn't have any of those plants um, eat uh, roots eaten by the gophers. Another little um, thing to keep in mind is California has over 300 uh, native bee species and many of them uh, live in the ground. And so uh, if you notice, there were some areas that had mulch but not all of her garden is mulched. And the reason for that is that the bees need bare earth to nest in. And so it's important to leave areas that are open like that for them to um, have their own habitat. And then um, one other piece is that when I was deciding on the plants, there were sp specific plants that I chose and um, my, the theory is that you want to have a big variety of plants so that there can be a really good robust ecosystem with lots of different levels of, um, of animals and wildlife and shelters and also repetition. So uh, there are a few different sages, there are a few manzanita, there are a few seaside daisies, there are a few buckwheats and, and that's important because um, just say with the narrow leaf milkweed, a uh, monarch butterfly may come and nest, you know, lay her eggs on the leaves, but if there's only one narrow leaf milkweed available, those little caterpillars are going to eat it up and they're not going to be able to move to the next one and survive. And so variety and repetition is um, a very important part of creating a habitat or wildlife garden. And then lastly, I didn't talk too much about irrigation, but Susan did say that she didn't have it prior 
to uh, the installation. And so we did install an irrigation system that's a drip system. And um, it's going to be really easy a few years down the road to block some of the drippers uh, for the plants that don't need that water. For instance, the manzanita that I mentioned. And there are a few other plants that will not need, the uh, trichostema will not need water in the future. And it will die if you keep watering it. So um, two years down the way, we'll just cap those areas and the ones that like a little bit of water will continue to get water. So uh, this is one of the final pages and I call it the babbling brook. You all got to hear the sound of this beautiful brook. Uh, it is a valuable part of their garden. So uh, the moving water is attractive to birds because they know that moving water is actually cleaning it. So it's a very clean water source instead of a still stagnant water um, pond. And so they will drink from that. The pools that are located um, in different spots where there's a little bit of still water, it's shallow. And so, and then there are rocks around it. And, and again, it's very visible for them to see their predators. And so they will bathe in those little pools. Um, the falling water that you see at the top of your screen there, the hummingbirds love drinking from falling water. So they dip in and they drink that uh, from that little area up there. And then the bees will go to the edges of the rocks and just sip the water from those edges. Uh, dragonflies will um, lay their eggs in the bottom pool of this pond and the pool is at the base, it holds all the water. So we had to dig it pretty deep so that when the waterfall was going, the pool wasn't out of water. So it's about four to five feet deep. Um, so um, butterflies, butterflies drink water, but actually what they're doing is they will land on the wet rock and they are drinking the water, but it will enable them to get the um, nutrients, um, the minerals from the various rocks because that is what's important to them. And then at the base, there are small fish which eat the larvae of the mosquitoes and the bats eat any emerging mosquitoes, the, Phoebes eat emerging mosquitoes and other flies. Dragonflies also eat emerging um, uh, mosquitoes from the pond. And then uh, the larger wildlife will drink from the bottom pool and larger birds uh, the same. Last but not least, this babbling brook offers this beautiful um, tranquil sound which makes hanging out in the garden pretty wonderful. So I wanted to end with a before and after because I do know that um, before one begins a big project like this, or even if it's a small garden, it still can feel overwhelming. Um, and that when I walk in, I see potential and I see where things can go. And so I wanted just to show you the before and after shot so that you know that if you're about to embark on a big project, the reward is fabulous. And then this one is my favorite picture because that hillside is pretty drab and, um, oh. you know, nothing there. And then this babbling brook is a beautiful, beautiful uh, masterpiece that Susan and Dennis will enjoy. Well, yeah. right. Thank you so much, Sally. Thank you, Susan. So let's take some questions now. Um, Someone asked, said, uh, Jenny said, we don't have room for a babbling brook. Can we achieve some of the same functions with a trough, an old bathtub, et cetera? Maybe with a recirculating or a solar pump, Sally? Absolutely. Um, as long as you have recirculating water, um, it keeps the water clean. So there are a lot of solar pumps that are quite small and they can either shoot the water straight up into the air and then back into the basin um, and that works just fine. So the sound is, is something that, that attracts the birds, but they're really looking to see that the water moves. And the pumps are not even that expensive. They're about, you know, between 20 and $40 for a, a small pump that, that can go in a barrel, like you said, or um, we, I've even um, just dug out like a three foot by three foot pond with a few rocks around it. And that works just fine. Yep. 
uh, keeping the water clean and sometimes having it deep enough to stay cool or else being sure that you scrub that thing, but certainly having water and having falling water. Having water attracts birds and having falling water attracts more birds. Stephanie, don't you find the same thing with your fountain? Yeah, and when you have it on, it's really the hummingbirds just kind of come right into that stream. Sally, actually, some people were asking about the pump. Can you talk just a tiny bit more about how you get that water back up? Oh. <laughs> okay, so um, that babbling brook is, you know, there's a there's a quite a few feet of elevation that um, the water had to travel through. So so the pump for that one, and I don't know the, the, uh, the brand name of it, but it was fairly large. It was about, you know, 10 feet, or I'm sorry, 10 inches long. And then um, we attached a pipe from the base that goes all the way up underground that was about an inch um, diameter. And it goes all the way up to the top and then comes down. And this is not a solar pump. So, um, unfortunately, I've had some bad luck with, with the larger solar pumps and nobody is making really good ones at this point. So for this babbling brook, it was more important. Um, it's just too big for the solar um, pump to handle. And maybe Tesla or some other company can make a better solar pump for these big water features, but they haven't yet. Um, we do have solar power, so it's connected up. That was one thing we had to hire an electrician to come out and do um, underground the wire to pump to power the pump. It was it was quite a big deal, but we've been kind of waiting a really long time, so we felt like it was worth it. And we have a hummingbird that comes every morning, and he's it's there drinking. We've also seen dragonflies. A lot of other birds are bathing in it. Fortunately, we don't have raccoons in our backyard. Um, it's fully fenced because there are deer around here, and I'm, so far that seems to keep out the raccoons. All right, well, we've had a question about you, you haven't seen raccoons. You answered that. The water recirculates, right? So yes. it fell at once and then it recirculates. Someone asked how long do you, how often do you have to top it off? <clears throat> We're not having to top it off a lot. Um, I've been thinking about that because of the drought. I've been concerned. Is this a really bad time? Are we going to have to let it dry up for the summer? We're just, we don't use a lot of water. There's only two people in the house. So, so far um, we top it up every couple weeks. Can I say, we, I have a pond in my yard and um, my very clever husband set it up on one of those uh, water sensing syst systems so that uh, it, it knows how much water evaporated the day before and at nine o'clock in the morning uh, the waterfall turns on and it drops in the amount of water that evaporated. And I know that that costs water, but I also know wildlife need water. And that's something that I'm willing to contribute. Um, Nancy Weninger from the Audubon Society, who spoke last Sunday, uh, said one of the most important things you can do for wildlife is provide them with water. If you can imagine all the water sources that used to be here that aren't here anymore, um, that's why we get so many birds in our in our bird in our pond and in our waterfall like they're counting on us to provide water so sure you have to top it up and it does take water but uh, I just regard it as one of the things that you know I feel that I need to do. Um, Sally so you probably have place about the water that uh, is that um, where you place your fountain or pond where where it's not in full sun all day long it does not have to be in the sun all day long so um, theirs is on the right side of the house. It gets morning sun, but, but then it goes into the shade. And so that helps with the evaporation level. It keeps it down. And I have a fountain in my front garden. Again, it gets some sun, so it gets the solar panel to work, but then it's in the shade and the panel is still working. And so I don't have to fill it as often. Okay. So my guess is that you probably have clay soil in that garden, is that correct? So we all have clay soil. People yeah. say like, oh, I have clay soil, but we all have clay soil. So how's it going with the clay soil? How are the plants doing? Uh, they're doing beautifully. I have to say though, that some of the garden, the soil was amended over many years because my dad did vegetable gardening back there, but all the stuff around the edges is solid clay. They're doing great. Yeah. I, mean, I just, the pictures that you see were taken over a month ago and stuff is, some of it's, it's doubled in size by now. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, planting plants that are from California, there's a lot of clay in California. They can deal with this soil because it's their, what they have adapted to over eons. 
Right. People shouldn't feel bad because they have clay in their yards because we all have clay in our yards, <laughs> but they still look good. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So someone asked, how did you deal with the weeds? Pulled them, <laughs> pulled them and pulled them. This spring we had oxalis everywhere. Um, and my husband and I just got into the Zen pulling weeds. Um, for me, it's a problem. I'm highly allergic to oxalis, so I have to wear long sleeves and gloves so I don't get it on my skin. But it just comes out and you look at what you've done. It's so much nicer than cleaning the bathroom, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so you were able to get rid of the oxalis or at least keep it under control by pulling it. You didn't sheet mulch? You didn't put cardboard down? We didn't. Mm, wow. Well, I wanted to, but Sally planted so many plants, over 50 species, and she we had talked about sheet mulching after, but after the plants were put in, it was like, no way. On the other side of my yard, when I do it, I'm gonna put in fewer and larger plants and then I'm gonna sheet mulch because I do have the cardboard already, so. Okay. And then eventually these plants are going to fill in, which means that they're going to take over and then there's less weeding to do. So that um, it's been growing very well. So that's gonna happen sooner than later. This is a very new garden. It was just planted when? November? November, yep, yep, November 2020. All right, I look forward to seeing it. So I have to thank you so much for showing the garden. It was beautiful. It was fun to see a new garden. And I'm so happy, Susan, to see that you finally got, I know you've been with me a long time. I know your name, I know your email address. <laughs> so I'm glad to see that you got the garden you wanted. And Susan, one last year we had a uh, landscape design, a free landscape design consultation. You won one of those, didn't you? I did, yeah. yeah. I kind of got you going. All right. Well, thank you so much. I want to say goodbye. I have a last few words for our viewers. So I'm going to share my screen one final time and uh, say, uh, last time, if you haven't had a chance to make a donation, if you would do so now, we would certainly appreciate it. Um, the schedule will be skipping over Mother's Day. And um, we'll be back on May 16th and May 23rd. We have a number of great talks lined up. I hope that you will join us. The Green Home Tour is on June 6th and 13th. You register for the Green Home Tour separately. Um, my tour will, my home will be uh, opening the tour on June the 6th. And uh, in closing, uh, I would like to thank our major sponsors again, the uh, major sponsors and also our community sponsors. And in closing, I hope this event has inspired you to include native plants in your own gardens. If you are in Alameda and Contra Costa counties, I hope to have all of your own gardens on the tour one day. I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.